Job chapter 1, verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? And then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? There is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and eschewest evil. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Hast thou, not made, hast thou made a hedge about him and his house, and all about he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his abundance is increased in the land. Put forth thine hand now, and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put forth thine hand, uh, put not forth thine hands. And Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. So let's have a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for this time that we have to come together and meet with you and, and lift you up. We, we praise you, Father, that you've organized the small work into a church. Uh, Lord, we're your bride, and there's no, special, more, no more special relationship or intimate relationship that you have than with your bride. Father, help us live to every expectation you have of this work. Help us do the things that you've called us to do. Send, uh, give us the resources that we need to carry out the gospel. Father, we just pray for more people to come and, and be a part of this, that, that they may be empowered to go out and carry the gospel and, and work alongside us. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. So the crux of this is, is the sons of God. Um, um, <clears throat> among them, there's this fellow named Satan. And we've gone through previous uh, lessons that Satan, the word means adversary. Um, there was a fallen angel named Lucifer who became an adversary of God who wanted to exalt himself up to the, to the pinnacle to be the, uh, my, my opinion is that he actually wanted to be Jesus Christ. He wanted to be the, the physical representation of God, that he would be the one filled with uh, the power of God, wanted to be God himself and, and, and the very essence, and that all us human beings would be subservient to him, that he would raise himself up. And we see that he is still, even as Satan, even though he's a fallen angel, he is still accountable to God. He comes before God. Uh, God asks him, what are you doing today, Satan? He goes, well, I'm going here and there and just through the earth. And we see that God says right off the bat, cuts right to the point. Have you considered Job? So God asks Satan what he's doing, and he already knows what's on his heart because Satan had already had his eyes on Job. So we see that God can read his thoughts. He knows his, his intentions. Um, God sets out a, 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 a very truthful um, uh, picture of Job that he, he in the Bible, uh, back in chapter 1, verse 1, it said that he was perfect, he was upright, he eschewed evil. God uh, confirms that, refers to him as a servant, none's like him in the earth. God gives a correct view of this person. Now, I always thought to myself, God gives a very truthful view of all of us. I pray that, that God's view of me is the same as a, a Job. I strive for that to be true, that God can look at him and say, you know what, there's no more person upright than he is. That's a pretty good report card to get from the Lord. Satan disagrees with him. Does Job really fear God for not? He doesn't fear you for not because what did you give him? So all of a sudden we see Satan and his pride thinking he knows more than God. God understood that the reason that Job was that way had nothing to do with what he had been blessed with. God understands the reason Job has been blessed is because of his fear and his reverence for God, and he had blessed him. It wasn't the, and Satan sees it the other thing around. You keep giving him stuff. And actually, if you look at when Jesus was being tempted by Satan, he tried the same old thing. I'll give you this if you bow down to me. I'll give you that. Uh, tempt God, do this thing. So he was trying almost to buy Jesus' loyalty to try to get him to sin. Adam and Eve. You're not going to die if you take of that fruit. You're going to see things as God. Let me, let me give you something. Let, let me offer you something. And the, the, the truth of the matter is, if God's changed you, and we had this conversation yesterday in Isaiah. I don't know if he realized how brilliant what he said was, but it was brilliant when the man said, if you give me money, I'll come talk to you. And Isaiah says, we got something more valuable than money. When God changes you, you can't be bribed to sin against God. It's going to be a willful choice that you make to sin against him. But it's not because he dangles something in from you. The Bible over and over talks to God's people, be not deceived. Be not deceived. And so they're having this encounter, and that kind of gets us to where we're going to uh, finish it up today. 
He says, if you put forth your hand in verse 11 and touch all that he has, he's going to curse you to, to his face, to your face. Um, I have to find out where I'm at. Okay. <clears throat> so here we, we, we got some, some, some questions we want to ask and get, get your opinion. Um, in today's society, they view God and, and Satan being adversaries, but they almost view them as being equal. Uh, the, the Mormon religion believe that Jesus Christ and Satan are actually brothers. That senses, th th that's, a, that's a serious accusation against the Lord and Savior of the world because what they're doing, they're putting him on the same playing field as Satan. Jesus Christ created Lucifer. That's right. He's subservient to him. So Satan tells God, you just, t you know, we talked about this last time we, we, we talked on this, <clears throat> the, the pride that, that he just tells God, you do this to him. You do that to him. So we get down to this thing. Why does Satan have to ask for permission to go tempt Job? He's Satan, right? He's powerful. Why? He can do nothing outside of the will of God. Even Satan cannot do anything outside the will of God. So here it brings to us today. If I'm going to be tempted and I'm a child of God, does Satan have to have God's approval to do so? What do you think? Yep, he does. So let's talk about temptation a little bit. Does God tempt his people, according to the scriptures? What was that again, sir? Does God tempt his people? Yeah. No, the Bible says God tempts no man. Um, God's disposition toward his people is to bless us and protect us. That's what he's committed to do. That's what he's promised to do. And try as he might, Satan cannot breach God's defenses of his children. So God can allow Satan to tempt me, but just as there were boundaries, Satan can't cross those boundaries. Now here's the thing. He couldn't cross that boundary if he wanted to. There are certain things, I heard a preacher describe it this way once, there's God's infinite will and there's his permissive will. There are things within his will he will let allow us to do, even allow us to get involved in sin. Uh, he always, I like how he put it. You don't want to be in God's permissive will. You want to be in his definite, infinite will will and a lot of times he'll allow us to go through these things and it's to teach us because if i go through certain temptations and i fail or i'm successful as a minister years later guess what i can get up and i can share with people and tell them hey this isn't just me reading this and trying to tell you i've experienced this let me tell you what a shambles things got in my life when i gave in the temptation and and then god corrected me the bible said we heard yesterday one of the scriptures that this is for correction god corrected me through his word you did this wrong it's like a father would. So we see that he's in control. Uh, we're going to read a couple of scriptures. I'm going to have uh, Nick, if you would, read Matthew chapter 6, verse 13. I'm going to have Robin read James chapter 4, verse 7. And then I'm going to have Andrew read 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. I hope I got them in the right order, but we'll try and we'll see what happens. You ready? Yep. Matthew 6.13, and lead us not into temptation. Okay, the end of the Lord's Prayer, Jesus teaching us how to pray, teaching his apostles, his churches how to pray, lead us not into temptation. So that means we can be led into temptation, right? That's obvious, right? Okay, so you go ahead, Robin. James 4.7, submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Okay, lead us not in temptation, and resist the devil, and he will flee from you. It's kind of painting a picture. Okay, Andrew, if you'd read what you... Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way of it to escape, that you may be able to bear it. Yep. Okay, so first thing we heard, lead us not into temptation. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. I've heard that resist a lot of times meaning, okay, got to run. That word resist, it's actually a battle. It, it defines spiritual warfare. If you arm yourself with the armor of God, and has, as Ephesians describes, and, you, and you're ready to do battle, and you've got the word of God, and you've got the breastplate on, you've got the helmet, man, you're ready to do battle. And you resist him the way Jesus did uh, when he resisted for temptation with scripture, being close to God through prayer, uh, the be devil's going to flee. Because what happens, the Holy Spirit, through this armor of God, begins to fight your battle. Andrew just read, you know what? <clears throat> Whatever temptation, there's nothing, this is amazing. Nothing we're tempted with today, nothing new. That's right. There is nothing new. So when we go out and we, we've talked about the RU program and, and people that are addicted and drug and whatever, the same thing that Satan has tempted that person to get involved in that drug, you know what, he's tempted, and maybe it wasn't drugs, 
But he's using the same vices and stuff, whether it's Brother Andrew, myself, whether it's Robin, whether it's Nick or, or James or Jerry. You know what? He's used the same devices to tempt every one of us to get us to draw away from God. Nothing new. Here's what's really messed up. Gee, let's organize a New Testament church so people come together. Now they have the Holy Spirit of God. And as we all strive to get closer to Christ, we strive to get closer together. And now we're like a small little army. Now we're not alone. Not only do we have God, we have each other. You know what? And we don't sit there and judge because, oh, well, you were tempted to do that and you gave in to it. I'm honest, I was tempted to do some of the same things. You know, sometimes you, here's, here's a shocker as a preacher before. Hey, sometimes I gave in to those temptations. And I got stung. It's like the, the drug addict out here got stung. So when somebody tells me their story, it's not going to, sh- I've told people over and over, there's nothing anybody's going to tell me that's going to shock me about a human being, what they'll do. Because you know what? I'm capable of doing the same things if I don't listen and follow. So we see that Satan has his boundary and God for his people, and it's spelled out so well in the New Testament. Hey, Job, <clears throat> pray that you're not led into temptation. Hey, Job, you resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Oh, by the way, Job, I'm not going to allow you to go any, through anything that you can't bear. Right. Because you know what? I have the ability to allow Satan to tempt you, but I'm also going to set boundaries up that he can't exceed those. Now, do you think Satan, if he could, would jump and, and jump over those boundaries and do whatever he could? He can't, though. That's the beauty of it. You know why? Because he's subservient to God. He answers to God. Um, and he always will. God gives, in verse 12, it says, And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he has is in thy power. There's the boundary. Everything he's got, all his possessions are in your power. You can do with them whatever you want. They're all in your power. And here's the boundary. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand, so Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. God gives Satan permission to go ahead and test Job in the way that Satan desires with no restriction. You can do whatever you want with his possessions. But Satan's not allowed to touch Job's person to the fact to cause him death in any way. Can't do it. However, everything else that Job has, God's placed it in Satan's hand. So, how does God remain holy and blameless by doing that? Does that seem like a bad thing? How would, is God still holy and blameless even though he'll allow Satan to do certain things? Mm-hmm. Okay? A lot of times people will say, why would God allow this to happen? You ever heard that? If he's God, why would he allow this to happen? All right? So, let's, let's, let's look at us for a minute, us human beings. Why are we susceptible to this? It's one re- there is one reason why we're susceptible to this. This sin in our life and the consequences of it. James 1. Yeah, read that one for me. If you would. James 1, 14. Yeah. Every man is, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And then 15 says, when the lust has conceived, it brings forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. death. He must have read my outline. <laughs> it was the scripture I was going to. I'm going to let Nick come up here and finish that. That's perfect, man. Here's, here's, here's what gets me. The reason that we can be tempted and fall into sin is because our great, 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 great granddaddy, Adam, fell into sin. Allowing Satan, and we're in the sinful body. Okay, There's coming a time that he's not only going to save us, right now we're justified spiritually saved set free there's a time coming that we're going to be saved from the very presence of sin in a glorified body and he promises that but as we're down here and we're going through the things that we're going through um, as a Christian and here, here's a misnomer just because a person is saved does not mean that they're going to be relieved from temptation uh, just because a drug addict gets saved doesn't mean they're not going to be tempted to go back to the drugs now what they have is they have the foundation in Jesus Christ to get off the drugs so the temptation is still there. And the reason the temptation is still there, the reason we'll fall into sin is because we're sinful creatures. Here's, here's the, the key. People say, well, why does God allow these things to happen? We sin because we enjoy to sin. Sure. We like it. Even to the point, how many people have you seen will even do things that will cause them harm because they like it? Oh, yeah. With the drugs, even to kill themselves because oh, yeah. they like it. Break up their marriage because of an addiction to pornography, because they like it. And you know, the Bible says, and Nick just read, when sin's finished, 
What's it do? What's it bring? Death. Does the Bible ever sugarcoat what sin brings? It brings death. Now here's the thing. God was so in tuned with Job because of Job's heart. And this is like, a, here's a challenge for all of us. That our hearts will be so in tune to God that he can look upon our hearts and say, I don't care what you do to him physically, what you take away from him or take away from her, you know what? They're going to remain faithful to me. God knew that because of Job's character. And it's funny because, you know, the laws of the land, how they change and, and you have a liberal agenda and you have all this stuff going on that a person like me would be, I'm, I'm a hater. And it's amazing because really people that would spit in my face, I love them enough to pray for their souls and I feel compassion for them. And I'll tell you the truth, um, that doesn't come from Scott. I'm a man, I'm kind of a throwback. You know, the first reaction, I'm not as bad as I used to be. But there's a, there's a reaction there of, of bad things physically you would like to do to that person. But as God starts to change you, it starts to change, you know what? Man, I feel for that person. I'm going to pray for that person. It hurts to see that person in that condition. Because you know what? It's because they hate God. They hate somebody that sacrificed everything. And I don't know how an eternal God can sacrifice everything, but he did. And cause separation between him and the Son to the, to just to purchase my redemption and salvation. Nothing to gain for himself because he's perfect. He doesn't have anything to... If I die and go to heaven or die and go to hell, it doesn't make God any bigger or any less because he just is. That was all done for my behalf. And you share that with somebody and the hatred that comes back toward that message. You're a hater. Yeah, well, I love you, but okay, you're a hater. Because you don't want... You preach against my sin. That's the issue. This thing I like so much, you, you preach against that. And why, we, why do we preach against that? Because we don't want, we know that it's going to bring death. And we know that if somebody dies without Christ, that it's over for them. They're done. They're out of existence to God. And they're suffering pain and hell and eternal lake of fire. And that's the truth of the Bible. He, he lives everything to Satan's hand. Satan could have chosen actually to leave Job alone if he wanted to. Well, you know what? This is a man of God. I'm going to leave him alone. Guess what? He didn't do that. He's got so much pride. If I can't have him, I'll destroy him. And, if I, and God's not going to allow me to kill him. But what I'm going to do, I'm going to make his life miserable. And I'm going to destroy his testimony. And I'll destroy his relationship with God. Now, I got, and I really believe Satan's mindset is like that. I believe he thinks he can destroy the church even though Jesus Christ said the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. There's a boundary for Satan. You can't, you can't destroy my church. And I believe he thinks that he can. What's funny about this, he thinks he knows more than God. How many people do you run across that think they know more than God? How You talk about the pride, the pride of man comes, it's no different than this pride that led to the fall of Satan, and pride always leads to a fall. But how many people in our government, in our society, in business, even some ministers in our churches think they know better than God? Right, and you know what happens? Whether it be tomorrow, today, next year 30 years from now one of these days i'm going to die and god's work is going to go right on mm -hmm. going on and he's going to use people that he chooses right. to bless to carry out his gospel uh -huh. and that happened way before i was born it's going to happen way after i was born now what i'm hoping is that we all get raptured out of this church and then we'll just have big big time but satan thinks you know what i know more than god um so here's another real real biblical Deep question. In this scenario between God and Satan, in this discussion, everything we discuss, who ultimately gets proved wrong? Satan. Satan. When has Satan ever been proved to be right in the history of creation? Ever. ever. He's, never been, he's never been on the right side of anything. And here's the sad part. How many people follow him? And he's never been proved to be correct or right. Um... I always, and I've used this story, and Brother Nick was there and had a conversation with a guy in the streets of Dayton, and I, um, I, I am not questioning people's education or, or human intelligence they might have, but giving an example of the ridiculous of men talking about evolution. And you remember the fly. Was it a fruit fly that he was talking about? Fruit fly, yeah. And he developed more wings, and it was proven evolution. Mm -hmm. And whatever his thing was, and it's, and it's funny because Nick and I are, Stupid lay people that don't understand, but we know what we understand adaptation. We see it all around us. Of course, God's creation adapts. 
You take something out of one climate, put it to, hey, the polar bears, they're not quite white anymore. Well, yeah, if they change climates, they, yeah, it's called adaptation. It's been going on since the creation. Okay, get over it. <clears throat> this person in, in his pride and his education is willing, now think about this. I, I'm the dumb one, okay? He's willing to risk his eternity because a fruit fly has more wings. Mm -hmm. If that's man's education, you can have it. Here's the thing. Satan, in his infinite wisdom, thought that if he took away the possessions of this world, of this secular world, that he would destroy God's relationship with Job. And according to Romans, if you're saved, child of God, there is nothing that can come between the love of God and you. Amen. Satan hadn't understood that. And here's the thing. The angels did not understand that type of grace because it never was extended toward them. Grace was extended to the human race. What an extent of the animal kingdom, what Satan tries to do. Hey, you know what? That fetus isn't really a person. You need to kill that. We have the PETA people. I like animals. I love them, but they are not as valuable as a human life. They're animals, okay? When the animal dies, it dies. Yep. That's it. They're, they're, they're govern, governed by time. We as human beings are within time, but you know what? We're going to live eternally, either in heaven or hell. God put a, a, a price tag on us that was very high, and he was willing to pay the full price. And Job is a, a, a walking, living, breathing testament of that type of relationship, and Satan just didn't understand it. <clears throat> you can take everything from him, Satan, but our, this love connection we have between each other, what really makes Job tick, you can't, take the, you can't touch it. And the reason, so let me ask you this. Why the boundary of you don't want, you can't kill Job? Why that boundary? What do you think? We'll speculate a little bit. Why? It's, his son. it's his son. Is it Satan's position to take life? No, no. Can't, do Can't do anything without God's permission. Plus, I think God wanted to bless Job. Yeah, that's a good point. <clears throat> After this was all over, yeah. and Job remained faithful, God wanted to bless him. And wanted to bless him for his, his, his obedience. And, and it was funny. If you read the story, and you go through, you remember Job did get... Like a human would. Little Phil's, why am I, oh, woe is me? Got, got that? And I love this when God says, gird up your loins. When the Lord tells you, gird up your loins because you and I are going to have a talk. Uh, hold on tight. And he asked Job, remember, where were you when I gave the lion its roar and I brought lightning and I brought the thunder from the sky? Where were you, Job? And Job's like, okay, yeah, I know my Redeemer liveth. Okay, I'm good. Right. And, and what's so cool about that, even in that conversation, you see the love of God. Sit down, Junior. I'm your father. Well, you and I are going to have a talk. Um, so, and, and my dad gave me stories too, you know, to get me out. Know, he was one of the generation that walked uphill in the snow both ways, three miles to school, you know. God's story is a little bit more in depth than that. And his story is actually true. I don't think my dad ever walked three miles anywhere, maybe, but anyway. Um, ultimately, it gets proved wrong. And actually, that's ultimately his eternal case. If you go to Revelation chapter 20, verse 10, here's another promise. God made a promise to Satan in Job. He said, uh, he won't curse me. Have you considered myself, my servant Job? And you can take anything you want. You can do whatever you want to him. You can't harm him. Can't take his life. Job, okay, Satan goes and I'm going to show you, Lord. I'll show you. And we find out that Job remains faithful and true to his God. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. Here's another promise. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. God makes another promise. Amen. Satan, the clock's ticking. And the clock's ticking and I am, I am taking account. Everything you do and everyone you deceive. And I used to have a pastor and he used to call it the devil and his crowd. I like that term. The devil's crowd. You want to be part of the devil's crowd, he would say. So the devil and his crowd, God's saying, look, the clock's ticking, and I'm taking into account. I don't miss anything. This, you know, that seven eyes of the spirit. I see everything, and every every minute, bit of deceit, everything you've done to undermine my plan, everything you've done to attack my people, even going back and everything you did to Job, you're going to pay for that, and I'm going to cast you in a lake of fire for eternity. God promises it, just like He said. You know what? Job's not going to curse me. I know his heart. Mm -hmm. And by the way, Satan, here's your plan. Wasn't well, that good news for him? Satan assumes that men are just like him. Here's the good news. You know what? We aren't. We can be reached. This is why, you know, we we're talking about going. Here's what's important. Here, here's, what, here's what's important, and here's why I'm not a hard shell. 
Men can be reached. I don't know the heart of man, but God does. And here's the, here's the kicker. I have met people that I thought that's an impossible case. And God saves them. Didn't see that coming. Um, people are not like Satan. They're, if you're living and breathing in this world and the Holy Spirit's working on you, there is hope for you. Satan's going to paint this picture. There's no hope. You know what? If you're living and breathing, there's hope for you. If God pours his spirit out and he sends his people and God will send his people to those he's trying to harvest. He's going to do that. Um, Satan thinks that every human being is going to strive for success and shun suffering. The Bible are full of men that did not do that. Uh, we, have, we have apostles in the Bible. Every one of them that were actually saved, accounting for Judas, died a martyr, except for one which was John, and he was put in prison. Every one of those men shunned success for suffering. The, the trail of blood from our New Testament church going all the way back to the apostles is full of the story of men and women that were devout to God that would rather suffer for his cause than gain the, the riches of the world. People are not like Satan. There's hope. There's hope. Satan's words reveal that his belief that only men serve God because of their fleshly interests. And where's the key? Satan does not understand the spiritual connection between man and God because the relationship between this church and God and we talked about even the church being a, a, a government physical entity that really is not. It's a spiritual entity. Jesus Christ was so emphatic about it's not about the things that you take from out and take in. It's the things from your heart that go outward. It's the change of the inward man that matters. And Satan doesn't understand that in the humanity. We were created in the image and likeness of God. That means we're a trinity. There's an understanding when, when God touches a man and he saves that soul and that conversion happens and all of a sudden they're connected spirit to spirit and that communication starts going on. You know what? The world, I'll go back to the devil and his crowd, they don't understand that connection. Only a born-again Christian understands. And here's the really key. I've been a born-again Christian. I'm not sure I understand it. But boy, do I enjoy it because you know what? God speaks to me spirit to spirit. Amen. He, he touches my heart. He, yesterday... When we went off and we did, a, we were going to go door knocking, and Isaiah made the comment, hey, we're not catching anybody at home. There's tons of people on the street. Let's go down and just hit them on the street. That was a divine appointment. We met three people that, that allowed us to pray with them in the street. So that's a divine appointment that God says, okay, I'm going to lead you here. As a Christian, that stuff happens all the time. Yep. And, and Satan doesn't understand that. Satan assumes that, you know what, we're just like he is. Everything's about what we can get our grubby little hands on. And if you understand and you start getting in, involved in the Word of God and letting the Spirit, you find out that the things of the world, regardless of how shiny they are, they're temporal. You don't really, you know, they're great to have. They're great, and God will bless you with temporal things, and that's nice, and there's nothing wrong with that. But you know what? That, that prayer time that you got when you're alone with God, there's nothing more valuable than that. I've never bought a new car. What do I like? Tools. I buy tools I don't need because they're shiny and they, and they, vroom, they make cool sounds. But you know what? Not a one of those things has ever brought me to my knees in my garage and brought tears to my eyes and things like that because God's speaking to me. And, and he's taking, Scott, I want you to, you know, it's the coolest. I want you to preach this. I want you to teach this. And then you're just, you're just wrapped up in it. And you know what? You can't put a price tag on that. Satan doesn't understand that. Satan can't begin to imagine anyone worshiping God just because of who he is. He can't imagine that. Rather than for what he gives. You worship God because of what he gives. And, and this church, it's an enigma to Satan. So he don't understand what he wanted. I'm going to destroy it. So what he's, what's he going to do? Here, here's, here's the next year. He's going to try to get in with the members and create division. Yep. He's going to try that. You know what? We had an open discussion today right here in Sunday School, brother. We need to have those open discussions because here's what happens. Mm -hmm. We don't talk. This is what Brother Andrew's thinking. But we never ask him. Pretty soon if we start talking these things out and we're in prayer, you know what we just did? We've allowed Satan not to get in and start division. I can't have this church. I can't, con but you know what I can? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to destroy it. I'm going to cause division. Mm -hmm. um, our minds, and I understand about being on the, uh, and I am a big, uh, per I'm going to propose prayer every time we get a chance at the church that we come and pray together. And I'm with Brother Andrew though. We're put here to get out in the community and reach people for the gospel's sake. 
Uh, he never, it's funny in, in the story of, of Moses, when they get to the Red Sea, they come to the Red Sea and Moses, remember the story? Lord, what do we do? Pharaoh's coming. If you read that story, do you see anywhere God ever told them to stop walking? They come to the water and he tell them to stop. He says, why do you cry to me? Get that rod, pick it up, part the sea. That's what he's telling. He, he has not told the New Testament church to stop. Regardless, if we come to the Red Sea or whatever we come to, you keep going. You trust me about how to get across that sea. My, here's my charge. You keep going. And we trust the God that can part the sea and allow us to walk on water. That's the God that we trust. Mm -hmm. So these obstacles that come up, um, you just keep going. And Satan doesn't understand that. He thinks men must be bribed to worship and serve God. And here's the thing. God didn't accept that. He thinks you have to be bribed to be. And he tried that. Which, remember what he told Jesus? I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. I'll give you an easy way out. You don't got to go die for these people. You just, you just bow down and worship me. I'll, give, I'll bribe you. Here's the beautiful thing about a relationship with God. Here's the beautiful thing about being part of this church. There is nothing expected of you from a monetary way, from a what can you give us, and there's nothing, expect, you know, there's nothing expected of God. Okay, before you're saved, this is what you've got to do for me. Here's what's expected. You know what? You surrender your life to God and allow him to work in you, and he'll convict you of the things that you need to do. There's no condition based on that. You know what, though? You've got to come clean, man. Lord, I'm a sinner. I'm despicable. I am not righteous before you. I just want you. You've got to come clean with God. That's, that, here's it. I'll speak for the pastor. The expectation of this church, if anybody walks in, they've got to come clean with God. Because if they come clean with God, you know what we're going to do? We're going to accept them. Because everybody in here had to come clean with God. I'm a sinner. I'm no good. Satan doesn't understand that. Um, it's funny. When I was eight years old, and, and since that, and even when I was called to preach at 18, God did not have to bribe me to do that. Here's God. I'm going to reward you because you're such a good minister. And that a boy. You know what? Here's what he did. He convicted me. I, my, I, it was almost the same way when I was convicted to be saved. He convicted me to preach because there was people out there that didn't understand the gospel. And I cannot imagine me talking to someone that would die and go to hell. That wasn't brought me to want. He changed my heart. He changed my heart when I was saved, and then he did it again when I was called to preach, because now all of a sudden it was about, man, there are people that are going to go to hell, and I need to tell them about it. And he put that on my heart, so there was no bribery. Satan doesn't understand that. If I take away your success, I replace it with suffering, all the saints will turn from God. Here's the funny thing about that, Satan. When I have faced suffering, do I turn away from God then? Here's what's funny. I'm more apt to turn away from God when I'm being successful than I am when I'm suffering. Because when I start suffering, the first person I run back to is God. The Apostle Paul, when he had the, the affliction, Lord, three times he prayed, take it away from me. And he said, my grace is sufficient. Paul then started rejoicing in his infirmities. Paul had to realize through his infirmities that that was the way that you got close to God. Because when he was weak, then God was strong. So you read that, you know what? And, I, and, and Satan is, you take away their success, they'll curse you to your face. Usually when I gain success is when I've got to be brought down because my pride starts getting puffed up. And, and it's the success that drives me from God. When I'm suffering or going through bad times, that's when I'm on my knees. My prayer is, you know what? When I'm on the mountain, I need to be on my knees just like when I'm in the valley. Because that valley's coming. Satan, here's the other one. He never learns. He's been at this for a long time, thousands of years. Satan is not teachable. That's where he's different than us. Guess what? We're teachable. If we'll surrender to the Holy Spirit, we talked about, I was talking with Isaiah yesterday. He does a lot of studying. He puts me to shame. That kid studies Latin and he studies words I don't understand or whatever. But you know what? He's teachable. I'm teachable. And the best teacher is the Holy Spirit of God. My best, I have been under some really good teachers. Men that were related to me, pastors, um, I've read after people, some really, really good teachers, but my best teacher through all of it has been the Holy Spirit. He reveals things to me that I just wouldn't have saw on my own. Satan's not teachable. He, nothing will change his mind. And it's funny because here, here's the key. Repentance is a change of heart. Here's repentance. I believe this, now I believe this. It's a change. It's a turn. Satan cannot, will not change his mind. God's given us the ability to be changed because of this word repentance. There is no salvation without repentance. Recognizing who I am, this was my mindset, this is what I believe, the gospel was presented, hey, I believe this. 
and, and it's believing the truth. Um, I agree with, with some, of the, some of the stuff we had heard yesterday, uh, and I agree with whether it be programs, whatever, those aren't the things that change men, those are tools that you can use. Right. Holy Spirit's going to change men. Right. I don't think anybody here believes any different. That we know we can't change anybody. So, on, on, on the last point, we know he doesn't learn or change. Here's the thing. In everything, in God's will and his purpose, do you know what Satan is actually doing? What's he doing? Advancing it. He's advancing God's purpose. Nick is on the ball today, man. I tell you. I do you? <laughs> Unwittingly, Satan serves God's purpose. <clears throat> you think about what he did. Going all the way back, uh, what did Satan set out to do to Moses when he was a baby? What happened to Moses? Where did he get raised? Pharaoh's house. The guy was trying to kill him. What did God want to do in the 1940s with the Hebrew nation? He wanted to destroy him through Adolf Hitler. What did he do? Those Hebrews all started migrating back to Israel. The geographical place of where Jesus Christ himself uh, was going to set up his kingdom. What did, Jeruz what did the Israelites do in the 60s? In the Seven Day War? They took Jerusalem back. Guess what? Exactly where God said that nation was going to be when Christ came back. Satan does a great job of unwittingly serving God's purpose. Yeah. And here's the thing. God used him as a... It, it, it has to be laughable to God. I'm using you and your people to bring about my... Antichrist. Mm -hmm. What's, you know, we, everybody freaks out about Antichrist. Antichrist, okay, is he an enemy of the church? Yeah, but we're going to prevail. What's Antichrist going to do? He's going to be the last Antichrist that's going to usher in the, uh, the uh, millennial age after the tribulation because Christ is going to come back. He's the last entity of the last Antichrist. There's been many of Antichrist, but this one's going to raise up. And guess where he's going to be? Jerusalem. In the temple. That temple. And guess what the Hebrews? They're going to be sacrificing. Just like the Bible says. Thanks, thanks Satan. Thank you. You're, you're serving God's purpose. Satan's efforts to produce the opposite of what um, he hoped to achieve by inflicting Job and the, with the suffering and his rebellion towards God and being an adversary to Job um, Basically, what he did is he deepened Job's faith and brought greater blessings to Job. That's exactly what he did. When Satan got to the pinnacle of what he was doing to Job, all he did was make more Job, Job more faithful to his God. So, going back to the question, why does God allow temptation? Because guess what? When temptation brings hardship on me, what's God going to do? I'm going to draw closer to my God because I know that's where my refuge is. Because you ever get to this point in your suffering? I know that I'm suffering. I'm not going through it. But as long as I've got Jesus... I don't need anything else. Right. And you know what? I think sometimes we go through temptation because we need to be reminded of that. Um, we got worries. Man, I worry about this. Got to pay this bill. Got to do this. Got to get up tomorrow. I got my agenda. Robin's got, che Robin's got a checklist for everything, you know. She does. She's just not her, but she does. She got check We got to fix the list. Got to do this and got to do that. And then I'll, you know what? When you step back and you just breathe, you know, all I really need is Jesus. Right. He's going to make it all come together. Uh -huh. And he compels her to write lists for I right, make sure I get things done that I'm supposed to praise God for the list right so good any questions or comments one of the uh, really good verses is the devil as a roaring lion walketh to and fro seeking whom he may devour yeah. I think that's key he's seeking whom he can yeah. he can't just attack anybody no. only those that uh, God allows it and it could be the you know the chastening of the Lord as a son. That's the only yep. way that he can attack you to bring you back to where you should be. You well, know? I think one of the things, too, if people read that, I think when people read that in their minds as Christians, because Paul, actually, Peter's writing to Christians when he said that, you know, and he's looking outside. They're always looking out to that other person. And within the church, that's a great scripture that, you know, as, you know new, a new church, um, he, I think he's going to turn the heat up. When this church organized it, even, you know, let me see who I can devour. I need to, devour, I got to, I want to get inside there. Oh, yeah. And um, I, I pray, you know, that Andrew got up and shared what he shared today because we need to have that open dialogue so Satan can't get in and, right. and, and do things. And um, that's why this, this lesson is important. And we, we talked about, say, we're getting some spiritual warfare things. Um, we need to understand what he does. And then when it happens in our life, we can recognize it and, like, you know, that's, that's just not going to work. It's the same old, same old, man. You got something, Nick? So, so Satan, if, he's in, if he is in obedience to God, does he believe he can undermine God's plans while being subject to him? So <clears throat> he's not, he's not, 
he's not obedient to God, but he only can do what God allows him to do. Because God is not authoring And him. in that position, believes he can undermine God's earth. You know what? There's a good... When Peter uses that word roaring lion, that's a good analogy. If you put a lion in a cage and you have him under control, he's not really... Because if he gets a chance, he's going to devour you. And that's a good analogy. God has Satan within his control, and Satan has nothing to do about it, but he's like a wild beast. Yeah, and I think that that, that word lion that Peter uses really gives you a... And God's got him on a leash. No, you can't go, you can't go past that boundary. 